Today we'll be showing you exactly how you can remove yourself from taking every single sales call inside of your wholesaling real estate business. And it's really not as hard as you think. Really, all you need is a simple and repeatable process that you can just copy and paste into another salesperson's brain. And today I'll be giving you the exact process we use in our multiple seven figure wholesale business to hire, train, and retain top talent so that you can remove yourself from the day to day of the business. And so I'm going to be starting with lead management and moving straight into acquisitions and giving you every single document I go over in this video in the description down below. So get ready to pull yourself out of the day to day and enjoy. All right, guys, so we're going to be diving into our first conversation that we have with any seller, and that's going to be called our diagnosis call. This is where we're figuring out if we're a good fit to work with the seller or not. Basically, are they truly motivated to sell their house and they have a reason to sell? If the answer is yes, then we're going to push them to an appointment where that we're going to give them an offer and we're going to go over that offer call in just a second. But first, I'm going to pull up this diagnosis script um, and we're going to go through all the key points that really make this actual thing work so that you can start setting more appointments. And also, you're going to have access to this script uh, in the Google Drive in the description below. So all the scripts, everything I'm sharing my screen on today, you're going to get access to it. So it's all base, very basic stuff. I'm not gonna go through the script. I'm gonna go through the portions of the script and like what's important about these things and like why they matter, right? So obviously the intro, just a basic intro, you know, that we've spoken with them before. Um, and the setting expectations is like really where the call starts in my opinion, right? So this is a very important piece. Basically, we're telling them at the beginning of the call what's going to happen next, right? So just to go ahead and read this, I'm just gonna read this. I think it's important, right? The expectations is it says, thanks for taking my call. Is it okay if I share with you how we work before we get started? Okay, they're gonna say, yes, that's fine. I'm just gonna ask you some questions about your property and situation. If you feel like we're not a fit at any time, please let me know and I will do the same. Seem fair? And what's gonna happen there is they're just going to be like, okay, so you're asking me questions about my property and I have the permission to tell you that I don't think we're a fit. And then you'll do the same. So, okay, so you're, you're picky and you're particular of who you work with. Seems fair. That's valid to me. So they're going to say yes. Okay, great. So if we are a good fit to work together, then what will happen is I'll transfer you over to my home buying specialist who will present you with the number your property qualified for. Is that okay? And literally by doing this, you're telling them, hey, here's how this call is going to work. And then after this call, here's what happens next. So they already feel like, okay, this is a professional company. And they're credible, right? So when you're doing any kind of outbound marketing, this is a very critical piece because you're allow you're letting the seller know that, hey, we're legit. For example, if I call some major company, let's just call it, say I call it Xfinity for Wi-Fi problems, right? They're not going to just take my phone call and have no process that goes through. They're gonna talk to me, they're gonna tell me what happens next, and blah, 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 right? The same thing anytime you you talk, you just wanna know where you're going. And if you know where you're going and where what's about to happen, then you feel a lot more comfortable to open up and to establish a, a conversation, right? Another piece of this expectations thing that if you don't do this in any sales calls, you need to do it every single time because an objection that you know you get is like, why are you asking me all these questions about the property? Well, hey, sorry, Mr. Seller, you know, at the beginning of the call, I just, you know, let you know that like, you know, we're gonna be asking questions about the property and the situation that you're in. And that just allows us to get a better understanding of what, you know, our finance department could qualify the property for. Um, and then boom, because you already had the conversation, they're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that, my bad. Or maybe they're not, you can get them off the phone because they're not even a good seller or whatever the situation, right? You, you understand. But anyways, we're gonna set expectations. Once we do that, again, that is the one of the most important pieces of the script. Can't stress it enough. People who set great expectations and make you seem very credible, allow your closers to close more. So be credible, be real, be a legit company. Because when you're doing outbound marketing, someone you text, they come back in as a lead. They don't know who you are. So you got to be like a legit company, a legit operation. After that, we're going to go into the property condition. This is basic stuff. We want to really dive into this a little bit deeper. So we want to, because we're buying virtually, we want to know as much about the property as possible. So like, here's a picture of how we have it set up in Salesforce. Um, you know, we just want to know everything from here. You can pause this, take a screenshot. Um, I'm going to leave it up for one second. Okay, cool. So you should have gotten a screenshot at this point. And I'm going to move on to the script because condition doesn't really matter. What I will say, big thing that has helped us a lot is if they say, yeah, there's been remodeling to the kitchen. Okay, what kind of remodels have been done? Just like go a little bit deeper. That's gonna give you a little bit more of an edge when you're virtual, right? Um, and then we wanna also find out, you know, is it tenant occupied? What does that all look like? What's the lease situation? We wanna get that information and that's all on the picture. But next up after we go through condition is we're going to be grabbing timeline, right? So basically, you know, assuming that we agree on a price, how soon are you looking to start this process of selling your home? And this is a very critical caveat um, that I feel like we do and most people don't do is 
what time, when are you looking to start the process? Start the process of selling your home, not when are you looking to sell your home? Because an, an object, like 25% of the contracts we get are contracts that are far out. What I mean by that is there are more than like three month closes because we have the ability to overcome this objection of like, I don't want to close for 90 days or 100 days because of X, Y, Z reason. Well, okay, you know, you want to close by them, but w when would you like to start the process of selling? Oh, I, you know, I'm okay with starting it right now. Okay. So that way we can put something together long term and, you know, that way you's already taken care of for you by the time we get there. And that's like how we overcome that. So that's an important question right there because people are, oh, I'd like to sell in 90 days. Okay. Well, you probably should start the process of selling soon because, you know, for us it takes, you know, six, you know, we don't tell them it takes six days on this call, but they should start the process soon, right? That's how we overcome it. Um, next, confirming roadblocks, right? This is basically going to be us finding out if there's other people of influence or other decision makers involved, right? So we would just ask them, is there anyone who has input on the decision to sell the property? Oh, it's just you. You're like, okay, great. So no one has any veto power to stop you from selling this property or you're the only person on the title, something like that, right? Yeah, you know, my wife or whatever. Okay, cool. Um, gotcha. And then basically we just want to ask them, so if we agree on a price a day, um, what would happen next? Oh, I got to talk to my wife. Oh, gotcha. You got to, you had to talk to your wife. Um, so other than, you know, talking to your wife, is there anything else that, you know, would stop you from or prevent you from making a decision today? Um, no, nothing. Okay, cool. So we would just ask for the wife to be on the call. Um, whenever, you know, our finance department presents you guys the offer, um, and then blah, blah, blah. Right. That's an important piece. We want all the decision make because what we realized before we started, this is on the acquisition call, an issue we were running up against is you know this is like two years ago right three years ago um is we weren't closing deals because they're like i gotta talk to my wife i gotta talk to this guy i gotta talk to my partner or whatever okay well if we can mitigate that by getting most of the decision makers on the call at the same time then that's going to help us close more deals than it did right um it also forces you to get creative with your um overcomes right so anyways that's that after we go from roadblocks we want to move on to motivation and this is just very simple we're just going to go straight through this. Um, you know, what has you looking at selling the property? I'm going to ask a few questions, few things here. We don't want to go super deep on the lead management call and motivation because if we go too deep, then what happens is you exhaust all the acquisition managers' resources to go deep as well because they just got really emotional and really deep with the lead manager. We just want to go deep enough to figure out if there actually is a problem and a reason for them to sell. And if that's true, then boom, we set it up, right? That's all we need. Um, so, you know, here's like some examples that we use. Like, it seems like it feels like, and we just want to ask like two things after, you know, they tell us like what's going on. It seems like that's been bothering you for quite a while. Something like that, right? Obviously you guys uh, know how to do sales and you've probably done sales training. If not, we do, we have three sales trainings per week in our um, program, doesn't matter. But once we go for motivation, we want to move on to price. Okay, we've been talking for a little while. How much are you looking for the property? Um, they don't know, whatever. There's a few overcomes on how we can get those prices out. But basically, this is the next really important piece of the script is we're going to give them a price anchor, basically like other investors purchasing properties. Um, and we do a 50 to 60% discount off of Zillow value or comparable value. Like so our lead managers know a little bit of how to comp. So if they think the properties were 300, you know, it's a little bit more accurate usually than Zillow. So they'll discount that to around like, you know, 140 to 160, something like that, right? That's an investor range they're going to give. And you can read this, but it's important to establish that it's not our offers, it's what we see other investors purchasing as. And then, you know, what would you say if someone offered you something like that? You, it, it allows you to have a little bit better conversation, right? They're most of the time when you're going to say, hell no, like, screw that guy. Like, I don't blame you. I would, I would say the same thing, whatever it is, right? We're going to basically move down um, and set the expectation for the next call after the price is all good and that's all sorted out. I'll let you guys read through the script. I don't want to bore you all with that. Um, but if they're not a fit, then we're just going to basically set up for, hey, when we're going to follow up. If we are a fit, then, you know, we're going to just set them up with home buying specialist. So it's going to be something more of like, hey, look, are you available at this time or this time? Um, or are you, you know, since all the decision makers are here, like, are you available right now for like, you know, me to transfer you over to a uh, the home buying specialist where it might take, you know, you know, 10 to 30 minutes or, you know, 15, 10 to 15 minutes for him to uh, give you the number of the your property qualified for or something like that. Right. And they're like, yes, transfer me over. Or no, um, I'm actually available later. 
okay, are you available at this time or this time? Boom, you book it, and that's it. Um, big things there for virtual. If you can do live transfers, it's the best because the only thing that we have virtually is our advantage is speed, right? Speed is what is our critical thing, and it's very, very important. We also have a list of objections down here. Um, you can go through these, uh, and that's pretty much that on the lead management script. So moving past that, the big thing, and I, I've hit on this like a few times, but when you're doing outbound messaging, marketing, you need to make sure the seller feels understood. You need to make sure that they have feel like you're a very credible company, because if you make them feel understood about their situation, and you make them know that you're a credible company and you're legit, so they build that trust, then that's going to allow the acquisition manager to have a much, much easier time on the phone um, with this seller to potentially convert them into a contract, right? So trust and credibility and feeling understood. Because as soon as someone feels like they're understood, their problem has been solved in their opinion, in their emotional state, right? So if I call for landscapers, I'm calling all the landscapers on you know, Google. The first person who answers, it makes me feel like, yep, that guy can get the job done. My search stops. So it's the same type of feel that we want to give all of our sellers when we're talking to them is that, hey, look, you know, we can take care of that. Like, that's not a big deal for us. And like, we want them to feel the relief um, and all the anxiety of their stress and their situation going away. And that's what we're trying to make happen on that appointment setting call. Um, so moving on, offer call. So basically, this process works virtually or in person. Obviously, in person, you're going to be doing a little bit more stuff, right? Extracurriculars, walking around the house, et cetera. But virtually, this is important as well. Um, one thing I'll note before we get into the offer call script, the average length of our offer call, we, when we had like this like two and a half years ago or whatever, we were closing around like, you know, eight to 10%, which is not great, right? We weren't super happy with that. One of the levers we pulled was increasing our average call time where it was like, it was like 12 minutes per average conversation on the phone. And when we increased that to an average of like, we're now like closer to 35 or 40, I haven't looked in a couple, in like a month or so, but we're averaging 35 to 40 minutes per offer call. Our closing rate doubled. So just to give you an idea, doubling the time you talk to someone forces your, your acquisitions managers to build more rapport, to go deeper into motivation, and to build a better connection so that they have better conversations. Better conversations equals more contracts. All right, so next is setting up the offer. And basically, this is just going to get the seller the basic expectations of like how things work. So, you know, this is in your pocket minus your mortgage, all your taxes, all the things basically telling them what's net, what, what are we paying for, what are they paying for, which means they're paying for nothing. Um, and then that it's sold as is. And then we like to state that we're solving this problem before we give the price. Um, when we give the price, we're just basically giving them it as the, not an offer, my, not my offer. This is what the finance property department qualified your property for. Your property qualified for, <coughs> your property qualified for $250,000. Something like that, right? Okay, they're always going to say that's too low. If they're not saying it's too low, that's because you're not offering low enough. And giving low offers will have people hang up on you. And so like the big narrative that we've been trying to push is like lowest allowable offer. How can you give the lowest offer possible and not get hung up on it? The only way you can do that is by building more rapport through understanding the motivation and like building credibility um, and just relating to the seller in that piece, right? So. That's why we spend so much time there. We want to give the lowest offer, offer possible so that we can just get a deeper discount, right? At the end of the day. So anyways, from a tactical perspective of how we're creating our offers is we're doing it in, uh, we, we have two MAOs, right? So the first MAO is like our cash wholesale offer. But in reality, like the way we created it is like how we would underwrite if we we're going to wholesale this property, right? So it's our two times in the property uh, offer from a virtual perspective, pictures and inspection. And then that number is usually, let's just say in this scenario, it's 200,000. Um, we're going to offer something like 185 to 190. In the scenario that, um, you know, we have another offer is our other MAO. It's for the MLS strategy. So if we're going to list this property on the MLS, which just means like we're going to do a novation, then our MAO is going to be probably closer to 240 to 250. And the way that we're going to structure this, and you'll see in the script, and you can read the script. I'm not going to go through it specifically. But we created a process that allows us to negotiate from like the 185 up to 250 and have it not feel weird by having um, that done in one call so we can close them on one call. And then also it's a process that someone can plug into extremely, extremely simply and extremely easily so they can just replicate it. So basically the way it would work from a high level is that we're going to 
offer 185, they're going to say, no way, that's way too low. We're going to basically ask, hey, what were you looking for? Or what were you hoping I would say? Something like that. And they're going to be like, I at least need 250, right? Let's just say that's the scenario. At least need 250. Okay, I got you. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to basically work up to our, um, our wholesale MAO. Gotcha. So like, even if I was to be able to come up to like, you know, 200, like that just probably, that's just not good enough. That's not going to be enough, whatever, right? Something like that. Then once they say, no, there's no way, like I said, 250 or nothing. Hey, there, you know, I'm not saying we can, but there may be a way that we can get you to 250,000. Um, and, you know, that's just going to be me having flexibility. Are you giving me the flexibility to have access into the property? And they're going to ask you what that means. And all the objections are in here. I'm not going to repeat them. But basically, that's the process. Offer low, come up to 200, be like, that's the best I can do with this, you know, with, with us buying it, right? Yeah, the only way I might be able to come up to more than 200 to like closer to that 250 would be like if you're able to get us access to the property. That's the flow. Then basically what that allows you to do is have a reason for each time you come up, right? So you don't feel weird. And then what it does is it gives you the ability to then, I don't want you to have access to the property and negotiate between the 250 and the 200. And then now you can go from having a 20, 30K deal to having like a 50, 60K deal um, because we wholesale it just from being able to negotiate between those two sides, right? So that's the strategy and that's what we're using. Um, and it really allows us to have a solid um, reason to come up in price. And it allows us to have a very repeatable process that people can just follow and plug right into. And the, obviously the innovation stuff, that's the next video in this process of exactly how to do that. But the hardest part is getting the contract signed. And so that's what you need to work on. You just need to work on this pitch. Um, if you don't want to do the, the MLS pitch, then obviously you're going to offer like 185 and then you're going to have reasons to support your 185 price that I didn't even mention in ours. But, you know, we give 185 and they're like, I really need 250. Well, I got to be at 185 because of this, this, and this or whatever it is. Right. And those are all going to be involved, but you're going to just negotiate from 185 to 200. And you just have to state a very good reason for why you're going to be at 200. And that's just like the reality, um, you know, repairs, whatever, flips, blah, 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 blah. And that's just how you have to defend your price. And we do the same thing. But once, you know, if a lot of people, price is never an objection, there's nothing you can do to overcome. But when you can listen to MLS and you have that other pitch where all you need is access, then it allows you to pay someone $50,000 more and still make 30K average deal size um, and get their problem solved, right? So it's a pretty powerful tool. Um, one thing that I want to say is, obviously, we have all the, you know, before we go into getting it signed. We have all these obje objections and you know we have an objection sheet and everything you can ever do. I think there's a lot of really good things in here. So I would go through and read that, um, add anything to your actual game. And then literally on, if you frame the offers right and do the MLS call from this one script, you can, you can get those signed uh, without any problem. But the piece that most people I see messing up on when they do uh, acquisitions is they just blindly send out contracts in DocuSigns. You shouldn't do that because you're just going to send it out and hope it comes back. And it usually, it, it does like probably 60% of the time, maybe 70 because we did it for a long time, but 70% is not very good. You get a, you should get a hundred percent. So the way that we got a hundred percent of our contract signed when we agree verbally is we go over a contract call. So we literally have this script right here that walks us through our contract and our contract is going to be in the um, actual drive so that you can replicate it. But this just basically goes through us reaffirming the contract. We have a little post close in there, basically just to reaffirm that they're good to go. Um, if they are good to go, then we're going to go through the contract call. Um, here's the contract call breakdown. Again, these are these are all scripts in here. You know, basically, um, this is all the different little nuances that go on. So you can go through and read all this. Here's the little objections that we have for our agreement um, when things pop up. And that's it. You just go over the contract, boom, they sign it, send it in DocuSign, and that's it. And you get done just like that. So that's the main thing that you need to make sure you change in your offer call um, is one, be able to add that MLS pitch, and then two, do the DocuSigns, and then three, increase the quality of conversations you're having by going deeper into rapport and then building more of a relationship with the actual seller. So hopefully this, this helps a lot. Um, but we're going to be moving on right now to hiring that person because we built the process that you can just plug into your business so you can pull yourself out of that acquisitions manager role and that lead manager role if you're still in that as well. So now we're gonna go into exactly how you can hire that acquisitions rep. It's actually quite simple. It's not, it's, it's simple, but not easy, right? Everything in business is simple, not easy, pretty much. Um, but what we wanna do is we wanna go on a site like WiseHire, Indeed, or LinkedIn, 
and we're going to make an ad called home buying specialist. So we've implemented this just very recently with three other um, wholesalers in our group as well. And just over the last week and it's worked for them. They've hired someone and like literally qualified people in like two weeks. So it works great. Um, and basically what you want to do is you just want to get their resumes and then all you're going to do is read them, right? So you're, you're looking for people who have two years of experience in sales and they ideally have real estate experience as well. You also want to favor people who have a current job. <laughs> they have a current job right now. They're going to be a lot better candidate um, than someone who doesn't have a job, right? Typically, general, we're generalizing here. Um, another thing you want to look for on the resumes is not to see them job hopping every six to 12 months. That means they're not very consistent or they're not very good, right? That means they're tired. So once, if they meet those criteria, so they have two years of sales experience, and this is for an acquisition manager to come directly in, two years of sales experience, they have real estate experience, right? And they've ideally, they've done acquisitions for real estate. That's the ideal scenario. Um, and then they also currently have a job. Those are people we instantly want to plug into our five-step process, which is going to be a discovery call, a role play call, a call with usually the sales manager, which is usually you know you um then we have a second role play call and then we have a panel call and then we send them an offer so that's our five call process and the if you don't have enough candidates people who don't have jobs you can you know you can pop them into this process but this has worked very well so the discovery call very simple it's 15 minutes we're going to go over the non-negotiables of the company and of great salespeople, right so you know we want to find things like what's is the are they going to be able to do the work schedule are they going to be a culture fit? Are they going to have the characteristics of salespeople themselves? Are they job hoppers? Do they have long gaps in work history? Why are they leaving companies, et cetera? Any things that like, you're like, okay, I got to have, you know, I don't know, maybe you'll only hire athletes, something like that, right? Um, that that's could be an example. Then basically after that call, we're going to send them a package of here's a script and here's, a, here's two good um, offer calls. And the best people are going to, review the script and at least listen to some offer calls and be prepared for the role play, right? Because if you know you have a discovery call with them and they like it, then they're going to hop on the next call and they're going to be a little bit more apt to do a little bit of work, right? At the very minimum, they need to just have the script and if they want, they can review a call. You're going to have that first role play with them and this is just going to be a normal offer call. All right, give me an offer for the property. Boom. There, no feedback, nothing. It's just the role play. Uh, if they do a pretty good job, like you know just gauge it Com comparison is how you can how you figure this out have five to ten people go through the first role play and you'll figure out who's good and who's bad um, then you're going to set up the call with you and essentially in this call you want to frame it from what they didn't like at their old job and what they did like and then you're going to want to sell your opportunity this is where you're going to sell them on working for you right um, so 15 to 20 minutes on why they did or didn't like their last thing 10 to 15 on what your thing is like why that helps them right and then 10 to 15 minutes on the feedback on their role play after the feedback on the role play you want to basically have the next role play you want to set them up with that and you can give them more good sales calls if you want right if they ask for it and then you want to just see improvement from the first call to the second call if you see improvement it's a great sign they're going to probably improve very quickly what i've seen and the best people we've hired is the first role play they're really they're pretty solid the second role play they're like almost good enough to do the job. They just need a little bit more information. Uh, they might even be good enough to do the job after the second role play. Then we're gonna have a panel call, which is gonna be where we go over every red flag we gathered. We're going to dive into what makes them tick. Like, why do they wanna be great? Why do they work? Why do they do all this stuff? And like, just personally, like what just drives them? Um, and then we're going to basically, throughout this conversation, we have to keep the narrative that this is hard. So I've never hired someone who's worked out and been like, yeah, this is a pretty easy job. Um, the, the people who are the best that I've ever hired, be like, yeah, you're going to do a lot of calling and like, this is going to be very, very challenging. Um, and you probably won't be successful in your first, like you may not even be successful in your first month. Like not everyone is, it's just, it's just not made for everyone. Like this is just a hard thing. And you want to keep that narrative through the whole entire interview process, especially after you sell them, um, not as much upfront, but after you sell them on the company, you want to keep that being a very like, this is not going to be easy, right? So this whole call is all about that. And then setting expectations very firmly with what onboarding looks like, what ongoing training looks like, and then what are the expectations of like the KPIs and uh, all that kind of stuff. And I'm about to go over our onboarding right after this. So you'll have all that stuff as well for your acquisition. If you like them after this call, send them an offer letter. Um, 
that basically states, here's what we're offering. Here's the basic things about our company. And here's what your onboarding looks like. And then boom, they sign that, you sign it, and we're ready to rock and roll. After that, we need to move on to the onboarding doc. So I'm going to pull up how we actually onboard these people to our team. So this is what we do this is our process. We just use this like uh, a month ago for our new AM. We've used this to train and, and level up, train probably 50 um, plus maybe 100 acquisition managers. And then also in our own company, uh, over 10. So it does work and it's definitely produced a lot of great people. So basically we start with their hours, you know, their expectations. This is what we wanted to see in their first two weeks. They want to contribute five colds to hots. So they need to get a pipeline of five hot people, hot follow-ups in the first two weeks. In their first month, we want to see one contract signed. Second month, we want to see three more contracts signed. So that's four total. In their third month, we want to see six contracts. It's basically, I did three, but we want to see six contracts. And basically this means they're performing, right? So that's where they should be. If they miss at any point, they're going to go on a pip. And um, we'll talk about that later. Uh, join our Discord, it's our community. Join our Trello, it's where a lot of resources are. Get access to systems, how to get paid. Boom. Now we're back to onboarding. And this is just going to be very simple stuff. Um, it, but basically, this is the order in which we want to teach them, right? So you can go through and read it. But essentially, we have documents and videos on all of these individual items. Every single thing you can imagine. And this is what they watch. So this is like their first day. After they've done this, they're literally just going to be cold calling through cold follow-ups to make five people into hot. They're also, we, we have every day, we have a training in the morning where we go through our, um, you know, our morning huddles, which is going to be 45 to 60 minutes. They're going to go through KPIs, um, what's their daily focus, and then a live call review, a role play, or some kind of other like specific um, objection that we might need to work on or maybe specific scenario we might, might need to work on, right? It's going to be our normal training. When they're in onboarding, they're going to get another 30 to 60 minute call every day for at least the first seven days, normally the first 14 days to do call reviews together with the acquisition manager director, um, to do role plays, to ask any questions about whatever's going on. And then um, that's going to be the gist of the daily routine. On a weekly basis, every single person gets a weekly pipeline review, which basically means their warm, hot, and negotiation pipeline is getting looked at every single day. And we're looking at it from four main things. Next contact dates in the future. Last activity date has been maintained and they've been actually contacted. Their uh, reason for why no contract is signed is there and it makes sense. And then the next action is actually uh, updated, targeted, and makes sense, right? So those are the main four things. Obviously, we're going to be looking at motivation notes and all kinds of stuff. The other piece that I'm actually forgetting, there's two other small caveats, is the MAO and the asking price. Basically, we want to see, is their asking price less than the MAO? If it is, and that's a really low-hanging fruit, and we got to figure out how to close that. That's like an easy one to close. Um, so that's, that's what we do on those pipeline reviews. So basically, if they are doing everything they should, and they should have results, and they got to be asking questions. So it's obviously, it's some in their court, but we're giving them everything they need. So the most important piece with acquisitions managers and running a profitable and good sales team is going to be accountability and having a culture of high achievers who are held accountable to being great, right? And so the definition of accountability for me and most people is just a reminder of a past commitment has been made, right? So a past agreement, past commitment, whatever it is. And that could be, you agreed to get two contracts per week. You agreed to make this many calls per day, whatever it is, we agreed on it. And that's just me reminding you. Accountability is just me reminding you of that. So basically, if someone has been off track in their effort one day, so let's just say today's Monday and I did not hit my KPIs of you know, my 60 phone calls because it's either one contract signed, two offers made, final offers made like to buy the house, or they need to give 30 outbound phone calls per offer made missed. And so if they miss their effort number, which would be like total outbound phone calls, that's, there's no excuse for that. So as soon as I see that happen, I'm going to not talk to them necessarily directly in the actual meeting. But if I see that on Monday and Monday afternoon, I see they don't hit their call number, I'm going to call them up. I'm going to talk to them and be like, hey, you know, I was just giving you a call. I saw that you, um, your, your calls number is a little bit down. I was just calling to make sure everything was, you know, everything was okay. And then boom, they're going to tell you like whatever's going on, right? And all that is is just like letting them know, hey, I'm paying attention. And you don't want their effort to ever slip. 
because of their effort slips, then they think that you don't actually care and you aren't holding a standard. So that's just very important. You want to do that immediately. Now, if their result is off track three days in a row, this is my opinion. Let's so say they go three days in a row without a contract. Um, then what you want to do is you just want to give them a personal call to have a conversation, right? Because if they're supposed to be getting two contracts a week, they should be getting a contract every couple of days. If they go to more than three on that fourth day, I'm just going to give them a personal call. Hey, you know, I saw that you're, you know, you're getting offers out the door that you should be. You're making calls. You know, we're just not converting. So I just wanted to kind of call and see how I could help. And then boom, they know how you can help. You're going to put together a quick plan. You're going to listen to calls together, whatever it is. Um, and then boom, that's going to be it. And then usually what happens is they get a contract shortly after. But we just want to make sure that they know that you're paying attention and you're there to help, right? Um, and then also our team, if they miss the numbers for a month, let's just say that their contracts needs to be, it needs to be eight. That's what per performing metrics per month is eight contracts signed. So if they hit five, um, then we're going to basically have them on a performance plan for a month, which basically just means they have to go back to um, doing certain activities in order to bring them uh, back up to speed. So performance plan, this is what it looks like. It's essentially just the formula to get good. Where are you at? Okay, I want to get two contracts per week or four, six contracts per month or eight contracts per month, whatever the number, that's my desired outcome. Where am I at right now? I'm at four, five, whatever. All right. How do I bridge the gap? That's literally the basics. Like, where do you want to go? Where are you at right now? How do you get there? Okay. What's stopping you from reaching it? Oh, stopping me from reaching it is my close rate. Stopping me from reaching it is my ability to connect with sellers or my ability to overcome with rejection. All right. How do we over, how do we get better at each shop cycle? Okay. My thing is close rate. All right. I probably should, you know, have more quality conversations with sellers and I probably should review my calls. Right. That's what I'm going to do. Boom. Okay. How do I get better at overcoming objections? I'm going to have the, I'm going to write down my own objection sheet so that I see it top of mind every single day and I'm going to pull it up and I'm going to just be reading it through whatever, blah, blah. I'm going to review my calls and write down the objections that I missed or that I could have hit different ways I could set it or why they didn't work or whatever. And then you're going to implement those things. And then we're just going to want to review those actions. So like, how are we going to review them? So for example, if my close rate's bad, I want to review my close rate every week. Okay, that's an example. If my objections are not doing, if I'm not overcoming objections, then I want to maybe like keep track of like how many objections I'm overcoming every call. Something like that, right? Like it, it could be something different. It could be like, I really want to overcome this price objection. Every time someone just like always says like, they're not ready to sell because the price is too low. Okay, well, I really want to overcome that. Okay, then boom, you can measure how many of those you overcame um, and got to a new one each week, right? Or whatever it is. And then basically each, this is a time period. So this is just like, oh, every pip is you use a one month pip. So it would just be like, if today is 717, then I would just put 817 down for this. And then that's it. Get everyone to sign it, everyone to agree on it. And then boom, we move forward. And this has been a very powerful tool because it's just every time that we do this, it just, the person just turns it around. Um, and obviously the outcome of them not hitting their pip for us, as you get better at this, um, is they, they would get fired. So that's, that's that. Um, so yeah, pretty much everything to do right there. So I would say to grab one nugget from this, go implement it. But the big thing is set up your team to where they're structuring uh, the appointments and offers the same way it's just makes things way more efficient and your team is just way able to focus on the highest dollar per hour activities. So thanks guys, go make some money and I will see you next time.